Okay, so I'm going to be primarily talking about sort of research design and thinking through some of the strategies. Well, a little lower. Um, thinking through some of the strategies for um, the analysis, the um, coming up with an appropriate sample size, what, what kind of research design, um, and thinking through how to describe these things in a grant form. If we can't get the grant, we can't do the project. Okay, so um, my, my, my background, I started out in um, my statistical methods research with high throughput genomic proteomic studies, um, microarrays, um, protein mass spec data. Um, and one of the, the, the things that sort of ran through a lot of the studies that have been part of, especially early in my career, is that the studies often failed due to poor experimental design, that, that we could use the you know, appropriate statistical methods, the lab techniques were, were strong, but good lab techniques, good statistical analysis, bad research design means no result, um, and or a non-reproducible result. And so many of the projects that I was involved in I think we, we kind of did many of the things right, but what a poor experimental design sometimes do gets to the failure with having a non reproducible uh, result. Um, and I think that you know the considerations of, of study design often get a little bit swept under the table and sort of the enthusiasm of big data, machine learning, analytics where there's sort of an assumption that the sort of the computer will will take care of the analysis part and we don't need to necessarily worry so much about about the the overall experimental design or the specific methods and, and that's actually somewhat exactly opposite to the truth that the more data you have the, the more carefully you need to consider the design considerations and more carefully you need to, to really understand and look over your data than in sort of a smaller data context. Um, so some of the some some of the basic terms that I'm going to be using, hopefully these are relatively familiar to everybody. Um, going to be a lot of the examples that I'm going to use are in the context of diagnostic modeling, predictive modeling with a, a yes/no outcome. And so, in terms of evaluation of the models, evaluations of a medical diagnostic test. The, the terms we use are sensitivity and specificity. Sensitivity is the probability that the te that are testing positive um, among those with disease. This is often, we can also call this the true positive rate for a, a model, a, a diagnostic test. The specificity is the probability of testing negative among those with no disease. Um, so um, one minus the specificity is the false positive rate. Um, some some important things to to, to note in sort of certainly medical diagnostic tests that while you might see the sensitivity and specificity or the TPR and the FPR reported, these are actually often really population specific. And if you move to a different population, these parameters, which we kind of feel like should be constant, are not necessarily constant. Um, the accuracy of a test is also another thing that we often will see as sort of an out output for the evaluation of a diagnostic model. Um, and the accuracy is the probability of a correct diagnosis. Um, the accuracy is one of the, I find, the least useful ways of evaluating a diagnostic test because it is so intertwined with the um, population prevalence of a, of a disease. So if, if you had a, an HIV test, and the HIV test said this person has, doesn't have HIV every time, no matter what the sample was. Well, that test would be right 99% of it. That would have 99% accuracy, but be completely and utterly useless. So the accuracy in and of itself is not necessarily always that useful. And accuracy can very much depend on the population you're sampling. If you, if you go to a very high risk population, your accuracy rate may apparently go down, even though the test characteristics are Exactly the same. So I typically don't like to use accuracy as a measure. Okay. So, so, so a lot of examples I'm going to sort of borrow from the the molecular biomarkers literature, specifically molecular biomarkers in cancer literature. That's 
one of my main areas uh, that I, I collaborate on. Um, and at, at the face of it, it seemed, might seem that molecular biomarkers and, um, and high throughput um, M health sensors may not have that much to do with each other. But a lot of the, the basic logical concepts of thinking through a, the design of the experiment, the analysis strategies are almost identical. You have a lot of data, you want to use that data to make con conclusions that are reproducible and useful in, in making a diagnosis or a prognosis. Um, <clears throat> so, um, in the, um, for the, the NCI has put a lot of effort into sort of um, working through experimental design considerations in molecular cancer biomarkers. And the, there's a, <clears throat> the first part of that is trying to think through sort of study design considerations for various stages of development of markers. And so that starts at the early stage where we have sort of the preclinical exploratory, where we're just trying to find a set of potential markers which may be useful. Um, this would be often called sort of the discovery studies, um, and we can have discovery studies in molecular markers or for, for um, you know, sensor and health kind of data. Um, the study designs are often case control design where we, we, we have a set of subjects with a certain condition, we have a set of ideally some kind of matched controls, and then we try and identify specific features that we can measure that will be different between those two groups. Um, as the development process continues, we um, <clears throat> will often go to sort of a step two, step two where we try and determine if the, the, the assays that we're using can, can really tell the difference more in a population-based rather than a convenience sample-based. Um, and then we get to sort of a retrospective longitudinal study where we might we collect the, the samples ahead of time and um, eventually measure the outcome of interest, but the, um, and we can do a nested case control study to, to really evaluate the utility of a, a single marker or a panel of markers. Um, that's sort of often where academia starts to end. Um, the steps four and five are often spots where, where it's sort of in a, in a NH kind of sponsor study, it starts to get pretty hard to move past that with sort of large cross-sectional cohorts or very large randomized screening trials. These, um, you know, particularly for the, the experience in the room, the, the, the first few steps are probably where you're going to be doing your first studies. <clears throat> so at the, the discovery stage, we're typically using high throughput molecular clinical imaging or sensor technologies. Um, one of the reasons why these studies often fail is that they're very poorly designed case control studies. So, um, and I'll, I'll go into that in, in a little more detail in a minute. Um, another part is that covariates are often not considered. So we, we may not really evaluate other predictive or diagnostic variables in conjunction with our discovery studies, which also can limit the utility of the results. Um, subjects can be matched or not. I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, for phase two and three studies, um, the NCI has come up with these, um, these sort of design standards, which are called the probe design standards. And it, um, I'll, go, I'll go through the four elements of the probe design. I think it's a, it's a very useful sort of way to conceptualize a design of, say, diagnostic, diagnostic high throughput studies. So we have four considerations, the clinical context, the performance characteristic, the test itself, and the sample size. So the, for the clinical context, we, have, we try to answer this, the central question that we have to deal with is for what population and what clinical setting is the biomarker intended? Okay. So this, this is true for a diagnostic molecular cancer study or an mHealth study as well. What, what is the, the context of the question that we're trying to answer? Where is the value we're trying to add to decision making? And 
the evaluation of that context is critical in trying to identify to determine what the right design is. Um, and we want to really make sure that this the study population should represent the intended population for the clinical ap application. So if we want to do a study to try and come up with a molecular biomarker for lung cancer uh, among those with say a CP screen detected uh, pulmonary nodule. So if you know we could um, do a biomarker study and have people with lung cancer and people who don't have lung cancer. So that's the sort of standard healthy people versus people with lung cancer. Unfortunately, the markers that you would you would de detect in that context would probably be useless because they wouldn't really be relevant to a, a specific diagnostic scenario. So the diagnostic scenario might be well, you are among those who already have a screen detected pulmonary <laughs> nodule, which ones have a benign nodule and which ones have a well, that might be a more relevant question than any result that we come up with will fit into that really specific clinical question. So trying to conceive of the really the specific decision point where any 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 mark any model that you come up with will be applicable is will then inform what the right study population is. Um, and ideally, that study population should be a random selection from prospectively collected cohort with outcome blindness. We don't want to we don't want to be collecting it or evaluating our data with knowing which who is the case and who is the control. We also have to we, to consider covariates or confounding. So confounding occurs when cases and controls differ on factors related to the to the biomarker and those are, that are potentially predictive of disease. So these might be, say, smoking status, age, ethnicity. And so when, when we have potential confounding, um, then that creates a, a, a very large challenge because we don't necessarily know if our results are due to that underlying confounding or due to a true association. Um, so in Usual observational studies, the, the solution to potential confounding is matching. So you, you match your cases and controls on, on the basis of characteristics that you think will be potential confounders. The, the challenge with matching, though, is that it renders the study population basically non-representational non -represent, of the true study population that you're interested in. And furthermore, it, the model that you create is a comparative model of cases versus controls. And then that model is not necessarily useful for a diagnostic scenario in the future where you're trying to evaluate for an individual patient what should be done. Do they have disease or not? Should I give them drug A or should I give them drug B? If we've only, if our sort of biomarkers, our, our models are only useful in a comparative context between sort of known cases and controls, the model then would not apply to a, sing a single patient for which we don't know what to do. So ma matching is something we have to be very cautious about. It's, it's, it's sort of an ingrained concept in a lot of observational literature, but it, for predictive models, it can be very destructive to create a model that is actually useful on a <clears throat> um, It's also important to, to decide what are the appropriate performance criteria for any model that we create? So the perform and also to determine what the acceptable levels of those performance characteristics are. Um, and those will often really depend on the clinical context of the study. So for example, um, if we're doing a diagnostic study where it's we want to build something that will be useful in a in sort of a diagnostic workup for disease, we probably want something with relatively high sensitivity. And we are willing to accept the lower specificity because we don't want to we don't want to take somebody who has a cancer and, and tell them that they don't. On the other hand, if we're doing a screening study, some of the opposite considerations hold that if you don't have if you're say doing PSA screening for for prostate cancer, unfortunately that has relatively low specificity, and so one reason why PSA screening is being downgraded in recommendations is that it generates lots of false positives. Lots of people go in for unnecessary and procedures that may result in a fair amount of morbidity. 
And so the, con the sort of consequences of a false positive can be fairly large. Um, so this, considering the sort of the costs of errors and um, the also costs of the tests are important in, in deciding what are sort of appropriate minimal performance characteristics that you'd want for a test. Um, so I, I kind of mentioned this already, the sort of what we want for a diagnostic or a screening test. Um, for the actual test itself, when, and I'm, I'm saying test as a very general concept, it could be a model that includes hundreds of variables, it could be a single marker, it doesn't really matter. Um, but we, we want the, <clears throat> that the, the biomarker test will typically be a combination of novel factors that we're measuring and, and also clinical or demographic factors that are, have been standardly utilized in the past for making a decision. Um, we ideally want the, that at the end of this that our, we can come up with a predefined algorithm that will combine those factors together um, and that the assessment of the algorithm itself, um, the, the development of the model and the, the evaluation of the model should be separate. So we, we can build a model on a, a set of subjects, but we then don't really want to evaluate the sensitivity and specificity or area of the RC curve on the basis of our model development code. We need a, a, some kind of validation to really evaluate what those, what those performance characteristics actually are. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the um, methods for model development. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail, just to sort of contrast two, two different types of areas. One is um, in these sort of philosophical bins. One is the sort of creation of a model that uses a relatively small number of factors that are individually assessed within the model. And so this would be something like a logistic regression where, where for each factor in the model, we're independently assessing the, the odds ratio for, it, for that particular factor, we're making an inference on for each one of the factors that's included in the model. Um, and the model is sort of readily interpretable. Versus the, um, I've used this word, it's probably outdated now, it's create a machine learning model. It's probably a better way to describe this. The machine learning model that, that uses a large number of markers without necessarily individual assessment of the relative utility of the, each marker in the model. Um, so within sort of approach number one, a fairly typical strategy is that we'll, we will measure a very large number of factors. This will be true in molecular studies and health studies. We're going to measure lots of things. But if we want to do a model, we're going to have to, to reduce that number of factors down to a manageable number to, to create a something like a logistic regression model. Um, and one way to do that is sort of using on, our, on the basis of our discovery set, using a combination of factors, a combination of metrics to decide which of our factors should proceed to the next phase of analysis. So those things can be things like statistical significance. That's a fairly common thing. People look at the p value of the association of each factor with their outcome of interest for all 50, 100,000 markers that they're evaluating and then prioritize on the basis of that. So that's one useful metric, but it shouldn't necessarily be the only one um, because a p value for a difference is going to not only be affected by the magnitude, but by the variability of the population and the variability might be fairly different among different groups you look at. So significance shouldn't be the only one. The magnitude of the difference is also useful markers that actually have a fairly large difference between the groups, even if they have high variability, might be fairly useful. Um, the ability to classify, so the, say, the error in the RSC curve for each individual factor would be a useful consideration. Um, also uniqueness. Um, molecular biomarkers um, sensor data, you're going to come up with lots of factors that are fairly highly correlated with each other. So a lot of different things that represent the same underlying concept. So if you're going into a model where you can only, where you can only be able to put a small number of factors, you want the things you put in to be relatively unique and to be measuring different underlying features. And so 
But so often we'll remove, if we have sets of parallel highly correlated features, then we'll only use, we'll choose one of them that we think has the, the, the best chance of success or choose two of them, but we won't try and go for it with 10 or 15 for a model to come up. Um, and then also sort of biological reasons. This could also be prior literature. If there's prior literature to support that a some factor you're measuring is going to be useful, that's another consideration of why you might want to pass it through to the modeling stage. Um, um, so the after the, the discovery component, then we'll often move into a next stage where we'll want to validate our the targets in an ideally independent group. We we'll want to construct a multi-marker model through either regression or some logistic regression. We'll estimate the model parameters and ideally add sort of clinical diagnosis clinical demographic factors to any classification model. Um, you know, with, with, in, in the, uh, it's, it's a fairly usual case that a molecular biomarker or a new sensor measurement is only going to be able to add a small amount of additional predictive utility to an optimal combination of clinical and demographic factors. So, um, you know, some of the commercial um, molecular diagnostic panels May add, may take you from an area in the DRC curve, say 0.7, if you just say have age and, and other readily measurable clinical factors to an AC of maybe 0.75. So the, the typically the added value of, of, of new factors may not be that high, but part of the problem is that mostly the effect of sort of standard, easily measurable things are not necessarily included in the in the modeling process. Okay, so approach two, the sort of the more the machine learning approach is more, the, the idea is typically to identify a large number of useful features to con construct a model and then validate that model on additional samples. There's lots and lots of different machine learning techniques um, that you can use. Um, I've listed a few of them, but there's, there's many, many more. Um, I'm not going to, that's not the way to focus my job. Um, but regardless of the type of model we use, whether it's a logistic method regression model where we look at individual features really specifically or a machine learning approach, it all really, the, the outcome really comes down to the same thing. <clears throat> How useful is this model in the clinical scenario that we've identified? And we, the utility is measured by the Things that I talked about: sensitivity, specificity, error in the RC curve, um, and as I said, we need validation techniques to accurately measure these things. Um, some of the this is sort of this is you can put this as opinion as, as the maybe be the title of the slide. So you know the the first component is that I don't I never feel like that there is any one type of model that's the best model. You know, if, if you look at the machine learning, the statistics literature, there's, so, there's lots and lots of papers saying this technique is better than that technique. Or I've developed this new technique and I've compared it to others and, and I win. And, you know, from my perspective, that's kind of a useless consideration because in the right set of circumstances, if you do a simulation study, you can, it's relatively easy to show that one technique is better than others. But that will often really specifically focus on the how that how the simulation study is generated. From my perspective, the the best model there, there's a few reasons why something might be the best model. One is that you know how to use it, and that you understand what the assumptions of the model are. You, you understand how it works. If you get to that point, you're probably fairly close to saying that that might that could be the best model for your approach because knowing how to use it and understanding what the limitations are and understanding what the strengths, then you, and if it still looks like an appropriate model for your data set, then probably it's a better choice than, than most other models. Um, regardless of what we, what kind of model we, we use, we need to evaluate the assumptions of that model. Every type of classification model has some inherent assumptions in it, and understanding what those are and knowing whether our your data fits into those assumptions is going to be critical in the successful application of any modeling approach. Um, you know, the third point is maybe even more important, which is understanding your inputs, understanding your variables. Um, 
do you have missing data? What, how does your algorithm handle missing data? Uh, often it's, you know, it's not necessarily well documented in the software exactly what it does with missing data. Sometimes it is, but you have to go in and look carefully. Anytime you do a clinical study where you're measuring things from humans, you will have missing data. And exactly how your methods deal with missing data may partially determine whether it's an appropriate way to, to, to model the, the data for your, your particular application. Um, you know, a lot of things say like logistic regression. If a subject has missing a missing value in any one of the variables that you're trying to put in the model, that subject will be dropped from the model. That's just a default of statistical software. Does it tell you that it's doing that? If you look really carefully, you'll see it. But most mostly statistical software will just execute a, an algorithm, and it won't tell you exactly what it's doing along the way. And then you wonder why you had a thousand patients and only 50 of them are in the model and why the model looks so strange. <clears throat> also considering things like outliers. Um, single strange values can, can really dramatically affect the results of any model that you create and really skew the interpretation of any of your variables. And statistical software again doesn't know what outliers are. It won't check for them. It won't. It won't identify them for you. It won't necessarily just on a default setting. Won't. Won't say here's a problem. You need. To, you need to fix this. This is another. You have, it's, this relies on sort of you visualizing your own data, looking at just looking through your your data files and, and really understanding what kind of value you're getting. Um, you know, also sort of understanding the measurement scale. Um, a lot of when I do a lot of that, the beginning of a statistical console, um, especially when the data set's not too large, I'll spend a lot of time just scrolling through the Excel file and asking questions about each variable. What, what is this? What does this value mean? Why is this missing? You know, you know, it's a you, you have values one, two, three, four, five. Are those continuous? Are those sort of an ordinal? Are there, are those just a race? You just coded as one, two, three, four, five. But understanding exactly what mean by the numbers that are in a data set. Is critical to being able to use that variable in an analysis. Statistical software will make its own choices for you, and you you want to understand what how the software is, is treating each of your variables before you put it into some model. I've seen a lot of grad students in biostat give me output where race is coded in one, two, three, four, five, and they did the analysis and it's treated as a continuous variable. So Software is dumb. It will make lots of well, and and does it, it doesn't know what's in your mind. It doesn't understand the scientific process. And so your responsibility when you're using software is to, to make sure it's doing the right thing for your data. And that's that is one of the most challenging parts of the analysis. Uh, you know, <clears throat> also understanding the relationship between variables. Collinearity. We always think about this really a lot with standard regression models, but for other machine learning classification models, something we also have to consider. Some techniques are fairly good at handling a lot of collinearity, some are not, but you need to know which is which when you're using it. Um, and you know, sort of wrapping that up, you know, automated modeling doesn't think and doesn't evaluate. It's your, your choice, you know, when you're using software, you still need to use your brain and, and, and understand things because the software won't do that for you. Um, next is um, I talk a, bit, a little bit about validation. So why do we need validation? Um, there's a, a few components of why the, um, we, we do. The first one is that when you're doing a selection process to whittle down a large number of features to a smaller number of features to include in a model, there is a lot of selection bias inherent in that. That, that the performance of the model will often look substantially better on those selected variables in the initial sort of model building set, then they will, and then the performance will actually be in a future set. So you'll say if you start with 100 variables, you get down to the 10 best, you know, and then estimate the coefficients for those 10 best and estimate the, say, the sensitivity and specificity in a future data set, it's very unlikely to that you'll get that high sensitivity and specificity. There 
this inherent over optimism in the process of variable selection. And the effect of variable selection is often much larger than you would expect. So um, if, for example, you start out with 50 variables, Say 50 variables, you do a logistic regression, we can say stepwise regression. Um, you have about 100 subjects. You know, how, how good of an AUC do you think you'll get by chance? You know, the, the default test is that the default assumption is that the area of the RC curve will be 0.5 in the case where there's no information. But just on the basis of selection bias, it's easy, it's fairly easy to get to a model that has. Uh, Aaron there a C curve of about 0.7 or 0.75. It would not be surprising at all if you could do that well just on the basis of selection bias. So you have to be very cautious about the interpretation of the performance in a training set. Um, also, we, we, we typically get a, a large amount of overfitting of the model coefficients in the context of a selecting a large slightly features from a large set um, and so all, all of these things sort of come together to say that just on the basis of sort of a discovery or a model building set you can't really properly evaluate how well that model is going to perform in future subjects so there's quite a few different validation strategies out there um, there's sort of the cost validation techniques, either leave one out cost validation or k fold cost validation. Um, there's tra uh, training test designs where you will, will say, sample two thirds of your subjects for a, to put into the model building set and then keep, have the remaining one third of subjects be used for the validations and, and performance um, evaluation. And then there's totally independent samples. Um, I'm going to try and go through these a little quickly. So leave one up cost validation is where we take one subject out, we fit the model on the remaining subjects and see how well it predicts the identity of the left out sample. Um, it's usually a fairly bad technique to use. Um, and yes, particularly if the sample size is fairly large, it will be essentially almost useless. I, I very rarely recommend people use this, although it's, it's something you'll see out there fairly frequently. Um, so k-fold cost validation is sort of more of a generalization where you will say one of the most common is 10-fold cost validation where you'll leave out 10% of your data, fit the model 90%, and then we do that process where you sort of can randomly leave out 10%, build the model each time. Um, that's a little bit of a stronger technique also because we, particularly if we randomly select that 10% to be left out at each stage, um, it, it provides a little bit of a stronger evaluation. Um, but it's it's still the the challenge of it is it's still it's sort of the the selection bias is still fairly hard to account for with cross validation. So I, I, I as a as sort of a gold standard, it's not really a gold standard evaluation. You still get some over optimism remaining in, in with cross validation. Um, when I write grants, I almost always do training test designs where. Um, we divide the subjects into model building and, and, and uh, validation cohorts. Um, one of the, the important features is that you, it's critical to maintain balance across the model building and the validation. So if we have 30% of our subjects are cases, we want to randomly select the cases and controls for each step so that we'll maintain that 30% in both our model building and our validation cohorts. That way, in addition to sort of sensitivity and specificity, we can also maintain proper calibration of the models within both of the sets. If, if, the, if the percentage of case controls varies a lot, then the model will look very miscalibrated on your, 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 your validation set just because of that imbalance. If your model still may be miscalibrated, but you don't want to design, you don't want that to be a design feature of your analysis to incorporate mis miscalibration. Um, so independent sample is, is would often be considered the gold standard, but it can be very risky though for a project. And the reasons that it can be risky is that if you're collecting samples, say from a different institution, they may be collecting samples using a slightly different protocol. They may be handling samples. Maybe if it's biological samples, they may be uh, not freezing it as quickly as you freeze your samples. Um, 
you know, if if, it, if you're just collecting data, your the data collectors may may misinterpret some of the questions and, and really collect the data in a slightly different way. Um, or it could be that some of the mechanisms are, uh, are really just different in, in, a, in if you're accessing a different population. Um, so, you know, the the independent sample validation, I, I try and shy away from. I'm not sweet, but we can really sure we have an incredible very high level of control over what's going to be done at, a, at another site. Um, so one of the one of the um, you know, considerations of um, sort of the model building is that many sort of clinical diagnostic scenarios will have pre-existing models. So um, you know, it's, it's great if you're in a, in a completely new world where you're trying to measure something that no one else has done before, but that's that's going to be somewhat rare. And so there will usually be existing models out there. And one way to really design your study is really focusing on sort of the value added of your new factor. Not, not necessarily whether your model is good, but whether your new model is better than what exists. And to do that, you really have to, uh, to evaluate sort of all the set of known factors and then create a model that includes those known factors plus the new things that you're going to measure. And then really evaluate whether there's, there's a, really a, a boost in performance with just sort of isolating the effect of those new things. Okay, so moving on to sample size. So this this is why lots of people come into my office and say, "What's what's the sample size? What how, how many subjects do I need for my study?" And I say, "I don't know." Um, and then we have a long discussion. It's this this is not a this is not a five minute discussion. This sometimes it's the discussion over two or three meetings over the course of a few weeks. Or more complicated study. So there's no easy answer to this. And so I'm going to present some of some of the basic concepts to sort of start thinking through. But it's there's um, lots lots of complexity in, in the in the in the process of uh, thinking through the sample size. So now, why do we need sample size calculations? Of course, the reason somebody shows up is because they want to get a grant, and they know that if they, they don't justify their sample size, they won't be able to get the grant. That's not why we do sample size calculation. The reason is to avoid wasting your time and money. There is no point in doing a study that has very low probability of success, and there is no point in doing a study where you collect far more, far more data than you need in excess of what's actually needed to answer the scientific question. Uh, either either sort of insufficient power where you don't have a large enough sample size or you have a too large of a sample size can be very detrimental, particularly when you're in your early career. You have to kind of be focused on sort of getting, getting the right size study so that you'll be able to find the thing that you think is there, but not, not collect so much that you spend years and years of your life on answering something that could have been done in six months. Okay. So, <clears throat> What do we need? What kind of information do we need in order to start a sample size computation? First is what is the study endpoint? Okay. This is the first question that one of the first questions I ask. And sometimes this is not such an easy there's not such an easy answer here. Um, this is this is also one of the things that uh, I as a statistician I, I help people work through a lot is what what are what are good endpoints for a, for a study and that will that will be also kind of a long conversation. Once we have identified those endpoints, though, we need to consider a number of, of, of elements. The first is what's the, the effect of the intervention or the magnitude of the relationship that we, we expect to see for that endpoint. Um, how much variability is there in the measurement, in, in, the, in that measurement in the population that you're going to be looking at? Um, you know, how much power do you want? This is actually an easy one because if you're submitting an NH grant, the power is 80% or greater. Um, do we want a one sided or a two sided test? This is typically also an easy answer. Um, almost all cases we want a two sided test. There are specific kinds of clinical investigations where you might want a one sided test, like an early phase clinical trial, but it's, it's, the, it's sort of a rare case rather than the rule. Um, what, what is the statistical test you used to, that, that we're going to use to compute power? That's usually something I'll try and answer. But 
in order for for you to create a sample uh, to do a sample size calculation inherently we need to identify a specific statistical test that will be used as the context for for computing power and of course the this, the overall design will be an important element in considering what the power is for study um, we can also compute power um, in, instead of computing for power it's sort of in, or for doing statistical inference, we can also do power calculation for estimation. If the goal of the study is to estimate the performance characteristics of the model, it's not power is not really an issue, but maybe the precision of our estimate of the area of the curve for the model is would be the thing that we would power study for. Um, we also need to consider study dropout. So if in any study with human subjects, people are going to leave, people are there's going to do data, and we need to account for that in the sample size the estimation process. We also need to potentially um, account for multiple comparisons. So if we want to have multiple outcomes in, a, in an intervention study, or we want to do a discovery study where we're looking for features associated with a particular disease of interest, in either case, we're going to need to adjust at the, in the analysis phase, we're going to need to adjust the multiple comparisons, and that means in the sample size calculation component, we're also going to need to incorporate that adjustment as well. Um, you know, some some very when I'm reading reading grant proposals, some of the things that that um, annoy me and are sort of red flags to me is it's a problem. One is when the investigators have present some preliminary data that will be relevant power calculation and then don't use it in that power calculation. That makes me wonder what, what's really going on. Um, you know, if I see that the sample size calculation doesn't use these, the methods in the planned statistical analysis, then that raises a potential question. Um, now, it's often the case that you're, you're going to be doing studies that the analysis is going to be fairly complicated. We might be using a longitudinal model with multiple time points of the outcome. We may be building a prediction model with 10 different factors. And to do a proper power calculation is almost impossible in that context. Um, so what often will need to be done is to simplify the problem into something manageable, do a power calculation in that, and then try and sort of somewhat do a hand wave to say, how does this simpler case extrapolate to the more complicated one? Um, but the, the right answer is not to say the analysis Techniques are going to be very complicated. We can't do a calculation because it's too hard. That's, that's not the answer. Um, one, one thing that I see a lot of for fan applications is the doing prediction models with large numbers of predictors relative to the sample size. They say we'll have 50 factors in the model and we'll have 80 subjects. Um, now that's probably going to give you a dramatically overfit situation, and it's particularly if the analysis structure doesn't doesn't have a fairly heavy select fairly heavy, really heavy variable selection procedure in it, you're going to get something that's probably going to be heavily overfit and highly over optimistic. Okay. So I have a, a few bad example power calculations that I've seen. Um, these kind of concepts I've seen over and over again. Um, the, the first one says the, the previous study had 150 subjects and, and found significance, and therefore we we'll use that same sample size here. So this is a somewhat of a mathematically flawed statement. Just because somebody had that sample size and had significance, that does not imply that the power is greater than 80% per percent. So this could be a reason why you get into the ballpark, but this is not a power justification that, that would be accepted. Um, maybe not for this audience, the second one, but um, our lab usually uses 10 mics per second. Um, but there, there, are, there are parallels in human studies that I see on this. Um, and you know, that may be true, but that is irrelevant. No matter, no matter what kind of study you are, you, you need to justify the sample size for cost, for, for human subjects considerations, and there needs to be a justification. Um, the third one, sample size calculations are not provided because there is no prior information which to pay for. So to do a proper ca power calculation, you have to be done with your study. That's that's the truth. So, but we we can still make good guesses. We can still take information from preliminary data from the literature to make our best guesses and to show that we've applied our brain to the problem and, and thought through a prox 
approximately what's going to be the situation. No one's going to hold your feet to the fire and say, well, you said the, the, the effect is going to be 0.04, but I think it's 0.05 until your calculation is wrong. The usual evaluation is, did you make a, a sort of best effort and really appear to think through the problem to justify the sample size? And, and, and a cop out is a, uh, is a good way to go. Uh, the fourth one is that often people will justify the sample size on, on the basis of the available population. And while it's incredibly important to describe the available population and describe how you're going to recruit patients and whether it's reasonable that you could recruit the number that you're going to, you're suggesting, at the same time, that is not why that's the, that, that's the right number for the sample size. That's the first step, but in fact, only the first step. Um, a lot of grants start in my start when they come to me and look at, with that last one and you know my name was often put in there and i say well that's nice but who cares um so just you know this this is also a, not a power track um, so it's a blanket assertion and and just because you have you put somebody's name in there that that doesn't mean the study section will believe it so what, what's a, an appropriate sample size calculation? And this is as one example. This will be more for an intervention study. So I'll sort of go through that first statement and tell you why all those components are necessary. So a sample size of 38 in each group will be sufficient to detect the difference of five points on the back scale of suicidal ideation, assuming a standard deviation of 7.7, .7, a power of 80%, assuming a two-sided significance level of 5%, and a two sample. So it's kind of a wordy sentence, but that sentence provides all of the use, the needed pieces of information to allow a reviewer to replicate your sample size calculation. Yeah. Yeah. Then, then we're in a situation where power is irrelevant. We're in a situation where it's sort of one of the conflict of estimation, where we want, if it's say feasibility, we want to estimate the proportion of subjects who can successfully complete the intervention. Uh, in that context, the the number of subjects may be the objective is to say come up with a reasonable guess as to what that number is and to have some degree of confidence about what the range of values are. So um, usually what we'll end up with is say, you but say kind of 20 subjects, you estimate the proportion that completed, and then we can compute the confidence interval for the proportion that completed. And you can base your sample size calculation on the sort of the width of that confidence interval. So you can say, well, we're gonna be able to estimate the number the proportion that completed plus or minus 10%. And so then that, that, that guess can then feed through to or towards the next phase where you can say, well, 80% completed, but that the, the true number could be anywhere from 70 to 90% and we can use that range for the, the next part of our study. So why, why, are, why, why are each one of these components here? The first is saying what the exact sample size is. It's, it's really disappointing when you're reading a grant application and you can't figure out how many subjects to be. And this happens, as a reviewer, this happens more times than I'd like to see. Um, so the specific, we, so we have the specific um, sample size. We then have the magnitude of the expected difference. Why five points? Well, well later we can justify why that five points is rational. And it could be rational on the basis of prior studies, it could be rational on the basis of preliminary data, it could be rational on the basis of, you know, a, a really good guess that you're, you're able to make, but ideally it will be supported by preliminary data or other studies. It doesn't have to be studies that are exactly the same as the one you're doing, but just something in the ballpark so we can say it's rational that, that an effect of that size could be observed. Um, with, we, we include the specific endpoint that's being evaluated, this scale where 
have a standard deviation number. This also can come from pilot data or prior studies. Um, usually, the you can get the standard deviation is often easier to estimate than the the, the magnitude of the effect because you can look at sort of population studies and see what what this endpoint what sort of how much variability there is in the population of these endpoints. Um, so typically, the power, the sample size, the significance level, those are mostly set depending on us. There's some design feature of your study where you have to um, say the significance level, the alpha level of that needs to be lower if you have multiple comparisons. And then just lastly stating the, the type of statistical test you use. So it's you know we can we can include all the the minimal level information just in, in one sentence. Um, if it's a more complicated study, obviously this is not going to be able, you're not going to do it in one sentence, but the the critical details are all here, and then typically we have a like some some accounting for dropout, and then a discussion of why we made why we made those estimates. Uh, you know, one thing that can often also be useful is to put in a table and say, well, this is the basic one, but I've also assumed maybe that the you know what would the power look like if the effect was say four points or six points, um, or if the standard deviation was six or, or ten instead. So you can sort of present a range of different possible scenarios to, so that the viewer can sort of evaluate what how that will affect the power and sort of show that ideally that you'll still have reasonable power even if you're somewhat off on your debt. Yeah, so I, I was thinking like I mean once you're evaluating this hypothesis, it's a very good hypothesis, but like normally when you're doing like some kind of like sometimes which is like so I'm thinking like how whether this status help in the So it depends what your I mean if you were doing an intervention study. So you're developing an intervention. If, if you're developing inter, an intervention, you're going to have an endpoint for that that you're going to be evaluating to see if your intervention succeeded in doing what you wanted it to. It's a, like some for succeeded in a mind develop some some just like like initially, I would think that like some hypothesis is going to work, but like, and I feel the system, I feel that like okay, there are some more features that was missing. Now, do I need to run like a full but big study and get the best to move forward? Or, like, or whether I can make any statistics? Well, uh, I'm, I'm not exactly sure how to answer that. Um, so, um, you know, if, if the if the if the goal is to say um, if, if there's an existing existing methodology and you want to improve it, um, then in some sense the the the, out, the outcome is still sort of a, there's, there's there's some sort of quantitative outcome you're you're going to look at whether it's sort of proportion of correct diagnoses or um, you know the proportion of people that this helped in some in some way. And then we can, uh, in principle, we can then evaluate the sample size on, on the basis of how many subjects would it take for us to prove that this new way is better than the old way. Um, and um, I actually have an example of that coming up. Um, I don't know if this will answer your question exactly. Um, you know, the sample size calculations for sort of modeling studies are a little bit different than, a, than a, the basics for an intervention study. Um, because these sample size may be based on meeting specific performance criteria rather than specific hypothesis testing. Um, and so we could either set minimal sensitivity, true positive, false positive rates um, for, for the, the eventual study, or um, we might be interested in, say, for a validation stage, comparing the AUC from a Sort of the gold standard model versus a new model that you'll create, and the, the goal will be to do the, the comparison of the, the AUC for the for your new approach versus your old approach. Um, um, you know, for depending on the specific sort of stage of the study, there's there's often fairly different criteria that we'll use to to justify sample size. Um, for the discovery stage, this might be based on Sort of a corrected statistical significance for differentiating, say, cases and controls, 
maybe using a false discovery rate or some kind of other adjustment for the fact that we're often going to be using them, evaluating a large number of features. For the model building phase, um, this will require a reasonable number of cases per marker in the model, um, or it could be based on sort of the desire for obtaining preliminary estimates of, say, the true, true positive, false positive, or error in the curve. Um, and in the last, the, I was mentioning the last validation phase, which is a comparison of a, a new model versus something that existed before, typically. Um, so this is kind of long. What, what, what's the uh, What's the timing? That should be wrapping up a few minutes ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I won't read this through. Indeed, this is a sample size justification that I just had in a, in a grant that got funded. Um, but um, this was a, a study where we wanted to combine multiple different types of markers. And so we had separated into a model building and a validation study. In the model building, we we justified the sample size on the basis of sort of the number of markers we wanted to include in the model versus the number of subjects we would have. So we'd want an, enough subjects to support the number of markers that we wanted to include. And also on the basis of the sort of the confidence interval for the for estimation of the performance of the model. Knowing that it's probably going to be over-optimistic, but we still want to get a reasonable idea of it from the model building phase. Um, in the validation phase, um, we Justify the sample size on the basis of providing a improvement in the area of the curve versus existing models, and also based on trying to come up with a reasonably good estimate of the AUC, so that if somebody were to consider using this this model in the future, we could do sort of a cost-benefit analysis if we knew what the sort of the the, uh, the relative performance level of the model would be. Um, you know, sort of the last thing I'll talk about is just sort of when to start working with a statistician. Um, and uh, I'm sure you've heard this 20 times before, but I'll say it again. Um, that it's very important to work with a statistician early in the research design process. Uh, that if, you know, our, our best chance to assist with coming up with a proper design and proper sample size evaluation is, is when you're sort of just conceiving of the study and you haven't made all the decisions yet, because if you've already just made, made lots of decisions about the design and everything you're doing, there's sort of no room for any for us to give any any advice that will sort of change your course. So, um, you know, I like it when people come when they have a barely formulated names page and that's it, um, and then we can sort of work through, you know, to and they've sort of put forth the question they're trying to answer and. Some of the technologies maybe they're going to use, but but uh, you know we can work together coming up with a design that's going to allow them to answer those questions. Um, so that process should occur early, months ideally ahead of time, because we need time for the sort of the iterative process, the iterative collaborative process to work. Um, I find that that no one does their best work on the first try, and that often you need time for things to sort of sink in and for you to, to be able to consult with multiple people. And so having this iterative process where you, where you keep on you sort of coming up with ideas, thinking about them, and trying to refine them, and then going from there. Um, you know, the, the data analytic methods I often find are things that, that should wait until almost near the end, because until the, the design and measurements and endpoints and everything like that is, is fully fleshed out, doesn't they doesn't you can't do a proper data analytic section. So that should wait till the end so that you don't have to keep on rewriting and rewriting it um, for, for on, on basis of any changes you make. Okay. Here, let's.